morning. The Wednesday morning uh, session of the Kansas State Board of Education is called to order. Please notice we have nine members present at this time. I understand the other one's in the building. Uh, uh, at this time, a motion would be in order to accept today's agenda. Ken Willard makes the motion. Kathy Bush seconds the motion. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries nine with one absent. And our next first item of business is Reading Success Annual Report from I Station and Fort Hayes University, Fort Hayes State University, and I will recognize Beth. Welcome, Beth. Later on, after I locked this all out this morning, trying to, <laughs> trying to get the PowerPoints loaded. So uh, it is my pleasure to um, have I Station and Fort Hayes State University come and present to you today. Uh, iStation has the contract for the Reading for Success program that's been supported by the legislature, and um, we're, we're excited for them to share some very positive results for you this um, second time they've come to present. So uh, Sandra Thomas, the CEO and president of iStation, wasn't able to be with us today, and in her place is Osa Fisher, and Osa is also um, one of the, um, your chief? Deputy Chief Operating Officer. That's right. It's a mouthful. So, just have to come closer. Okay, so um, she will start the presentation, and then when iStation's finished, Dr. Kathy Sanders from Fort Hayes State University will present the Fort Hayes part of it. Thank you so much. Welcome to the State Board of Education. Thank you. It is an honor and a delight to be here. Um, as Beth mentioned, my name is Osa Fisher, and I am the Deputy Chief Operating Officer of iStation and in that capacity also serve as the iStation project manager for Kansas Reading Success. So it is a delight and a privilege to be here today to talk about what we've seen, not just in the last year, but in the last several years uh, within Kansas. A little bit about iStation uh, to familiarize yourself again with, with the company. We were founded in 1998. That means we have a big birthday coming up next year. We'll turn 20. Uh, we have grown tremendously since our founding uh, with now over 220 employees and 4.5 million students enrolled in the program. We're proud of that growth, but equally proud that our founding principles have remained unchanged. We were founded back in 1998 with a principle of leveling the playing field for all students and really assisting teachers, allowing them to put more time into the classroom and doing what they do best is, is assisting students uh, in how to learn. Uh, our tools do allow more time for teaching, but they were also designed to work in multiple environments regardless of some technological limitations that we know many schools face. That means we work on multiple, almost any device at this point, uh, and also in environments with very little bandwidth, and that, those are all keys to our success. We're also proud to say that along with the 4.5 million student subscribers, we also have multiple statewide implementations under our belt, of which Kansas is one. Other states include Texas, Florida, New Mexico, Idaho, and Arkansas. We're proud to partner with these uh, state implementations and achieve success at a very broad scale uh, through these partnerships. In terms of the Kansas Reading Success contract, uh, this was awarded through a competitive RFP process back in 2015. It allows free access to all public uh, schools for pre-K through eighth grade, and it's our reading program that is uh, associated with Kansas Reading Success. We launched after the school year started in October of 2015, and this academic year actually marks our third year with the state as a state-sponsored vendor, so thank you for that. Also, as a reminder of the cost, and I'll go a little bit more into this breakdown later, um, but the maximum cost to all of Kansas is 2.1 million students, serving all eligible 355,000 students in pre-K through eighth grade. If you break that down, that's a cost of $5.92 per student per year. In terms of the enrollment, this is as of December 5th, 2017, you can see that we have students enrolled in every grade, pre-K through eighth, uh, with the heaviest enrollment being in the third, fourth, and fifth grades, the lightest enrollment being in pre-K. But we've made significant strides and gains every year that we've been in Kansas, uh, and I will show you the growth rates that we've seen uh, since 2015. 
This breaks down the enrollment between students enrolled, districts, campuses, preschools, and counties. You'll see that in every uh, grouping, uh, we've seen growth beyond the previous year and that our uh, percent of eligible population serves also continues to grow. Rather than spend a lot of time on this slide, let me go to the graph. This graphic, let me identify the colors. The blue line is our very first year in uh, Kansas. This was 2015, 2016, and you can see we first enrolled students in November of 2015. That's that number 18,364 you see at the very bottom of the page. Every month after that, uh, we continued to enroll students and ended that very first year with 104,000 students enrolled. The second year, the 2016-2017 year, is the red line. We started that year with 89,196 students coming back on board immediately and quickly surpassed what we had done in the previous year, even by the, by the September month. Uh, we ended that year with, almost, uh, with over 30,000 more students enrolled at 139,699. I'm also very proud to say that this year, our third year, is our best year yet in Kansas in terms of enrollment, starting the year at 110,000, and right now, as of uh, December 5th, at 143,000 students enrolled throughout Kansas. That's 40.8% of the eligible population, and we have found that the fact that we have uh, been funded through 2019 gives schools and districts the confidence to invest in training their teachers to learn and implement this program with fidelity, so thank you for that. District en enrollment has also continued to grow. We are now at 64% of the eligible population with districts using iStation through the Kansas Reading Success Program. Again, the blue lines represent uh, each academic year, with the blue line 2015-2016 ending with 144 districts, the red line being 2016-2017 ending with 174 districts, and this year, uh, the year still obviously uh, going, but growing every month with 184 districts enrolled <coughs> with iStation. That is a 19% increase from the prior year, and we're only halfway through it. We invest heavily in professional development. We have found not just in Kansas, but throughout the United States, that the more uh, teachers and districts know about iStation, the better they are able to use it, uh, and the more eager they are to use it. Uh, over the 2016-2017 school year, we conducted over 27 on-site professional development trainings and 21 digital webinars. In 2016 and 2017, we also gave outside and beyond the scope of the contract seven additional on-site trainings, and we did that free of charge. And we do that because we know that the more people know about iStation, the better they will use it and the more excited they will be to use it. For 2017 and 2018, 10 on-site and seven webinars have already been conducted, again, already by December of 2017, and we, at this point, have four additional trainings scheduled free of charge, and that dialogue continues as the demand for iStation grows. We do conduct feedback at the end of every professional uh, development session, and I know Fort Hayes has conducted a larger study as well, which they will talk about shortly, but the teacher feedback has been tremendous. 97% of educators who have attended an iStation training felt that the iStation specialist was both knowledgeable and was able to assist with questions about the implementation. We asked them to rank the iStation training on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the best, and the average rating was a nine, and they felt iStation was helpful to their students, school, and district. We got another 97% mark, uh, for educators who responded feeling they benefited from attending training workshops on iStation use and implementation. And this is why we continue to invest in this avenue to help people understand the depth uh, that we offer in our program. And we just want to highlight the value of iStation. Uh, we are definitely, because we're at the state level, offering this as a significant discount to what we would offer a campus or a district if we were just selling on a uh, on a district to district basis. I already mentioned that the total cost per year is 2.1 million. Uh, that breaks down into 1.64 million for the license fee, that's the technology fee for the software. $210,000 goes to Fort Hayes University to conduct research on the program and its effects. 125,000 is dedicated for training and implementation, and 125,000 is for project management, engineering, and customization. We do want to highlight that we do not require a hosting fee, which a lot of our competitors do, uh, we offer that free of charge to Kansas and to really any school or district who wants to use iStation. 
And again, with 355,000 eligible students, that is an average cost of 592 per student per academic year. And with that, let me hand it over to Tracy Roden, our Vice President of Curriculum and Research, and she will walk you through some of the research that we've been able to conduct uh, on iStation in Kansas. Thank you so much. Good morning. Last year when we were here, one of the biggest questions that you guys had was what can um, iStation's assessments tell us about success on the Kansas State Assessment in English Language Arts. And at that time, we didn't have the data to be able to do that type of analysis. But um, Shawnee Mission, Dr. Dan Grumman came to us and said, I really want to know what I can find out about the relationship between iStation's assessment, which is ISEP, iStation's Indicators of Progress, and the, the Kansas State Assessment in ELA. And so he graciously well, he requested it and then shared their state level data, I mean their district level state test data with us from last year. And so we have psychometricians at SMU that partner with us to look at that data and what they did was found a relationship between the Kansas State Assessment in English Language Arts and ISEP. And so basically one predicts the other or ISEP can predict success on the Kansas State test. There's a relationship which we're not surprised because they're both assessing comprehension skills and how children are doing in reading. But we took it a step further and looked at what can we say about the scores on ISEP. Districts and schools and teachers really want to know what score on iStation's assessments will tell me that my students are likely to pass the Kansas State Assessment in English Language Arts. And so we call those predictability cut scores. And their ranges, they're based on a confidence interval of 95%. So now we have cut scores for grades three through six. That was the data that Shawnee Mission shared with us for all levels of performance on the Kansas assessment of the, of the likelihood of students performing at that level based on that cut score. So what does this mean? What does it do for the educators? Um, it allows them to know the relationship between third through sixth grade in the two assessments. They can assess the likelihood of passing the state assessment by using the ISEP assessment. For example, if they know the cut score to pass it or to um, be at a level three, and they see that the child is way below the level three cut score, they know how much growth that that child needs to perform in iStation's assessment to be able to have the predictability of passing at a level three, even a level four, to see how well that they do. They can immediately determine who is most at risk at not passing that state assessment and who has um, the, predict the probability of passing it even their first day of school. We all know there's students that come in ready to take that assessment right away. But unfortunately, there's a majority that aren't ready and teachers have to struggle to be able to get them to be ready. Uh, also, educate administrators can gauge in advance, is, is their instructional plan working? iStation provides an assessment and computer-driven reading instruction. But we know that the measures on our ISIP assessment are measuring everything that's going on in that classroom and all the other um, instructional strategies that teachers are using and the plans in place by districts to be able to say, this is how our students are performing. So when they look at the iStation scores and compare them to what we've said with the predictability scores of the cut scores of how they'll perform on the Kansas assessment, they can be able to gauge are what we are doing in our district actually working. And if it is, great, and if it's not, what kind of changes can we make? They don't have to wait until um, April or May 2018 to determine if they should have made changes into, through the school year of 17-18 or not. You have with you a handout of the actual study of everything there. It's a lengthy you know, document, but there are, there's a table in there that says exactly what the cut scores would be. And what we plan to do is to issue that to deliver it to the Kansas educators. Dr. Grumman wanted us to present it to you guys first, to then destroy the data that he shared with us, and then would allow us to share it with the rest of Kansas so that the districts can use those cut scores to help them determine success on the Kansas ELA assessment this spring. We also wanted to know if we use these cut scores and we go back and look at 2017, while we don't have individual state assessment scores of students all over Kansas, we do know how students performed on ISIP that used iStation last year. So we did a little bit of analysis on our own data and applied those cut scores to the students using ISIP. And we determined that 81% of the students that took had an ISIP 
assessment in April or May last year would have performed at a level two or above on the Kansas State assessment as compared to looking at the whole state report card of 71%. Now, granted, that is a, pop, a subset of the population, but that's the kind of impact and kind of use that districts can use with this cut score. They can look at their schools and look at their different grades to determine what are the likelihoods of students' performance on the Kansas State test at levels one through four. And I tell, think with... Tell me again what, what the state is 71% and our district goes down. So let me go back. So the... We looked at the state report card of Kansas and showed that the, there were 71% of students that scored level two and above. So basically basic and above. We understand that level three is really what we want to be at. But who was not level one is what we looked at, and it was 71%. So we took our cut scores that we used and, and looked at those against students that took ISIP last year. That's the only students we have access to. And we found that 81% of those students had a 95% predict, you know, confidence interval, 95% that they would have scored level two or above. So it's an example to show you guys of what the districts can do with this type of analysis and apply it to their students at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year to see how it lines up with their passing rates on the Kansas assessment. You can't get statewide data because of the Kansas policy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We were able to acquire Shawnee Missions because they came to us and requested it. And we could go, we would accept the same data from other districts as well to do the same type of predictability study. But Shawnee Missions, a suburban district in Kansas, large, it was a sample size of over 5,000 students looking at thir third through sixth grade. So we feel that it's probably, you can generalize it to most of Kansas to use those cut scores in order to plan and predict. We have the same type of study in Texas, Georgia, one for Florida should be coming out soon. And so it really does impact instructional decisions because we all know that passing the state test in third grade and up is very important to our educators. Anything else before I pass it on to Fort Hayes? I don't see it. Fort Hayes is going to share growth that they saw throughout the state and I'll hand it over to you guys. I have to echo what OSA said. We're very honored and very pleased to be here. Uh, we spend the entire year doing some of this research and looking at some of the data and, and making decisions. And it's nice to have an audience that we can share some of this stuff with that we do our work for. So we really do appreciate it. Um, Beth, Dr. Beth Walliser and I'm Kathy Sanders from Port Hayes. We have two of our members that are under the weather. We seem to have a flu bug going around Hayes at this particular time, so apologize for that. Our names are up here. Uh, this year we were able to utilize the Docking Institute of Public Affairs, was able to help us put our paper together for um, our presentation. Uh, in paper form to you and, and for our presentation here today. So we're very happy to have them. Um, the sponsored agreement between Fort Hayes and iStation covers the growth, the progress that students make uh, in overall scores and also in different categories. These are the categories that they cover. Not all categories are evaluated on in every grade level because uh, some of them are not applicable to grade levels, so there are different scores when you see the final results. Uh, our research team has been asked to examine possible correlations between participant students' assessment scores and school data. We're going to be doing some future research uh, based on what uh, iStation was able to do, and we certainly are going to be encouraging more districts to ask to have the predictability studies and, and correlation studies that were done with Shawnee Mission, uh, especially since Hayes is involved now. We're obviously going to ask them to participate. And we also conduct other searches agreed upon between uh, both of our entities. Notice that all of the data is de-identified and it has to be presented to you in aggregate form because of the privacy law. 
Um, this year, uh, we used the data at the end of May, and so at the end of May, there were 174 school districts with 139 plus students that were enrolled pre-K through eight, which from year one to year two was for us a 30, 30 school district growth and about 35 and a half thousand student growth for that. Out of that 35 and a half uh, number, total number, and I'm gonna start at the bottom of this slide and work up, we were able to, to use 27,300 K through eighth grade, eighth grade students who had pre and post test scores. So that's our sample, is 27,300 right at 300,000 uh, uh, students. And for pre and post, we took scores in September and scores in May, and then uh, calculated the growth or the progress that they made through those nine months. Uh, all of our uh, data then is based on this, this pre and post test. Uh, because of the privacy law, we have to do it in aggregate form. And so using uh, the National Center for Educational Statistics, we have divided the districts into the categories of urban, suburban, town, and rural. So all of our aggregate is just based on those particular definitions. Last year you had asked us, well, what does that mean exactly? Now you're not gonna be able to read this, but you have this PowerPoint and you can go and this is alphabetical order. Uh, there are 119 districts that are categorized as rural. And uh, I'm giving you just a few minutes maybe to look for your favorite. There's another slide of rural since there's 119. Again, you have access to this. But for the data that we're presenting this year, these are the districts that were used. Uh, the town, uh, there are 45 districts. Yes? Those were the rural districts that are actually using iStation. Right, that are actually using iStation. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, town uh, districts, these are the ones that have signed up and are using iStation, make that more clear, uh, in alphabetical order. And then it gets fairly easy when you get to suburban and urban. We have six suburban schools, of which Shawnee Mission is one, and then we have four urban schools in the state of Kansas in our division. So when we are referring to, this is what the aggregate urban school students uh, have grown or their progress. These are what we're referring to, suburban, and then the rural and the town, which are far more and greater in number. Um, the summary of our analysis, the first test that we've done, and we, we, we've worked at three areas. So this is the first area that we have used. In the first one is the indicators, iStation indicators of progress, the ISIP, which has been referred to, which is the expected growth of students in a specific time period. So these are normed, nationally normed, and as I've said, we've used September to May as our period of growth. So from September 2016 to May 2017 is our growth period for the data that is with this. Um, the analysis is used then to uh, compare the iStation norms, the national norms, to what Kansas actually students actually do in those four categories. So again, it's all aggregate. So in those four categories, not by district, not by student, but uh, in those categories. What we have found is that most grades show an increase significantly above uh, the population rate. So we're very happy with that. And a uh, further breakdown of that is that grades, uh, first grade, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade scores, all were very significantly above the expected growth, which means there was very significant growth above the norms. Uh, third grade had significant growth. Their growth was not quite as large as the above four grades, but it was very it was significant. Grades two and four and five also had progress. They were above the norms, just not statistically significant, but they were above. Uh, kindergarten scores, you will notice, were below the expected. Anyone have a question about that? 
I do have something later on, but I think this is a really good time to come in and say, uh, this was something that was rather interesting to us, and we wanted to know what, what is happening here. What can we look at? What variables can we look at in kindergarten to find, to find out why were the expected growths lower than what was, why were the actual growths lower than what was expected? Uh, and we come up, came up with a couple of things. Out of 202 districts total that, we, that use iStation in the state of Kansas, 20 of those districts, and some very large districts, do not have a mandate for full-day kindergarten. And so a significant number of the schools do not have full-day kindergarten. Um, uh, iStation, based on their norms, there's a threshold of time. If students use it for a period of time, then uh, they, they will experience growth, and that's what the national norms are telling them. However, uh, at this, in kindergarten, if you do not have a full day, uh, iStation can, can get truncated and not quite used that much. Now, obviously, a hundred and, I'm not a math major, <laughs> 84, yeah, one of <laughs> whatever. Uh, districts do have a mandate, but we haven't read the mandates for every school, and some of those mandates are just as soon as the new school gets built, just as soon as we get teachers in place. So that doesn't mean that they have full-day kindergarten, but we think it does supply some evidence for full-day kindergarten, which we know that you support. Uh, something else that we looked at, and which we'll share with you on the next slide, is that their uh, kindergarten actual scores were higher than average which uh, means that we have some pretty good kindergartners that are ready for kindergarten when they come into kindergarten in the state of Kansas. And so their growth would not be as large as someone that comes in at a very low level in the areas that are identified in kindergarten to grow. So they have less need to grow. And so the teachers probably are using iStation for their lowest students and using it as supplemental material and therefore allowing um, the most needy students that they have to be able to utilize this, this program, uh, which then would not have the growth. We are going to be in, uh, interviewing some of the kindergarten teachers if we can get some to agree to that. So we're interested in asking questions. Uh, I teach on a graduate level. I have Kansas kindergarten teachers in my school. And I've been watching their assignments. And in any number of assignments, I can tell that they are using iStation as an assessment. But every one of them that I've had, and there's been a large number this year, have indicated that they're not using it to their full of, its fullest potential. You had a question. Well, I have several, actually. Oh, okay. Go right ahead. Uh, I, I wanted to comment. I would imagine that the bottom bullet will change now that we have full-day kindergarten. I would imagine it will, too. There, but, but it's been a few decades mm -hmm. since I've had statistics. And I, can, can, you, can somebody define... Very significant and significant. Very significant is at a 0 .01 uh, level, so 99% significance. It's, it's a high level of significance. Very significant at 0.05 level, 95%, okay. um, more or right, less. Right, right. I'm, and I'm, I'm not trying to talk static statistics talk there. Uh, but there has been growth, some really good growth and some growth. So does that help? Okay, thank you. Um, the next one that we did, and this is the one I was referring to, uh, is the overall reading ability scores. All of those little categories that were on the first slide, um, they're not all uh, identified or assessed for every grade level. But with those categories, we took only the May score, so the final scores, students that were ending well, they would be finished in May, that score, and compared it to what the national norm score at ICE Station is for what the national score for students in May would be. So we took those and we compared those two scores together for the different subsections. What we found, and there's kindergarten, kindergarten through three and six through eight were above. The population M score is ice station national normed. 
pop or just the M is then Kansas students. So we have the population M and the M scores, uh, and we're very happy that docking was able to do this for us. Uh, third or fourth and fifth grades were below. Now they weren't below much, but they were below what was expected at the end of the school year for fourth and fifth graders. Uh, and I down there, comprehension and word analysis were at or above the national uh, averages. The vocabulary one was the one that was very much below what was expected. So uh, we're going to be interested in finding out why that is. Uh, with kindergarten, uh, oddly enough, it was the phonemic awareness that was very much below. But phonemic awareness is a, a basic component. And those students, phonemic awareness is all oral. So to get to having vocabulary or comprehension, they have to be able to do the phonemic awareness first. And so obviously, those were the very lowest students. And all the other students already had that ability, so it raised the score significantly there. OK. Uh, the third thing that we did is you had asked, you know, what are, what are teachers, administrators, and parents thinking about iStation? So we sent out a survey. Again, we are not able to find out which schools are involved with iStation, nor which teachers use iStation, and definitely not the parents because of the privacy laws. So we had to send out our survey a little bit differently. We sent links to the superintendents of the schools, or of the districts, excuse me, and asked them to disseminate the links to teachers who were using iStation, administrators and buildings that were using iStation, and parents who had children using iStation. Because we really want parents to be aware of that home portal and that they should be able to use it. Um, you'll notice with the administrators, we had 35 administrators. We had a number of administrators that said, oh yes, we'll disseminate this information. And when we got our results back, it wasn't quite as many of the administrators that had done that. Uh, we will be replicating this this year, and so I think uh, as we t as we hand out or send to the administrators the results of this year, they're going to go, oh, we should have been in on that. So I think we should have some. Another thing that I should say is that we did have it officially translated into Spanish, and so we do have Spanish editions of these surveys. Uh, in the paper that you will be getting, uh, we do have all of the questions and for each one of these surveys. Administrators were not asked too many things. Uh, we had 32 from the suburban area, one from the town, two from rural. Um, overwhelmingly, they agreed that they knew what was going on, that they were familiar with iStation. We thought that was very good. And then uh, about a third of them uh, used iStation for Tier 1, a third for Tier 2, and then a smaller percent used iStation for Tier 3, and then the 25 for other. Other just means they're using it for multiple, in multiple ways. Sometimes not the curriculum. They use it for just supplemental. They only use it for assessment. Some do the full curriculum. So there are three different ways that they can be using it. Uh, so there was some great use of that, and this is what we would expect, because level three then is the for the lowest students. As one of those former administrators from the rural area, uh, you, I'm going to suggest that you revisit how you send that out, because I know that we would get multiple emails from places that we didn't know, and so they're easy to ignore. Uh, however, we had sent out a, a cover letter first saying, we have the contract to do this with iStation. We really want your information. If you have a suggestion, we would love to hear it. Can that be done through here? Can't be done through. Okay. Well, that and it has, to go through this, it has to go through the superintendent. So uh, we, we can send out through a listserv that something's going to be coming out. Oh, that would be wonderful. Uh, and acknowledge that, or we, we can do that. We. Give it can't some. Be involved in the, you pay attention to Dale. Whenever you get a message from Dale, you that know, sounds you pay good. attention. Okay. Uh, or from Randy. So we could probably Not notify <laughs> Dr. Watson and say it's going to be sent out. Would you put something yes, up? Something we can do that. Because I, that would be because wonderful. Days, there are days that things that they're just overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, and you just, quite frankly, don't have time to pay attention. 
I should say that Brad was a former student of mine, so <laughs> you want to know the way. <laughs> we will not blame you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can I take any credit? Well, it's probably not. Uh, there are other questions. Right. Ann Ma has questions. <laughs> the teachers, uh, obviously, they're the ones working the most closely with iStation, and so we were very interested in what they had to say. We had 324 teachers in these areas that completed the survey. Uh, half of them have been using it for uh, less than a year, some for over a year, and some for more than a year. So those are your uh, percentages there. Uh, 78, we were interested in do they take uh, advantage of professional development, so uh, they receive professional development from their school yeah. or from iStation, to use iStation, and then 38, or a little over a third, uh, had received professional development from iStation. Now, remember that this is only up through May of last year, so there's been many more opportunities, and as I said, I know Hayes is going to have them, and iStation has been very good at providing this, and I appreciate that superintendents and, and principals are allowing their teachers to be able to go to these. 79.2% of the teachers said that they felt that there was an alignment between iStation and their beliefs, and that... Um, really impacted their use of iStation. The more closely it aligned with their beliefs, the more that they used iStation. The vast majority of teachers, well over 90%, 90, I think 7%, felt that iStation was relevant for use with their students. We have a couple of board members with questions, starting with Ann Ma. Oh, thank you. Um, well, my concern about the survey was the same. Evidently, all the surveys showing us is what a few very enthusiastic very low, very suburban low, districts which show. Which is why we've not really... Yeah. And I was curious as why Shawnee Heights was rural, but that's... I guess there must be a... No, concern. it's suburban. No, it was oh, listed. Shawnee Heights? Yeah. Sh okay. But that's okay. But anyway, anything we can do to get that up? Because we don't know what 90% of the schools using it think. The definitions for the uh, rural, suburban, town, and urban, they, they come from the National Center for Education yeah. Statistics. And uh, you're, you don't like to get into the NAEP deta uh, data in that detail, but it's, it's also used in the NAEP data. It's used for a, a lot of comparisons across the state, so you can look at, at it. So it's, it's pre-populated. We don't make those decisions. Yeah. Okay, Sally. She just answered my question. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Okay, I can go ahead. Uh, this is almost immaterial, but I did want to share it with you. 24 parents, hallelujah, uh, did answer the survey. Of them, only half of them were aware that it, there even was a home portal. Now, remember that this is a really low number, which is why the note at the bottom, although 24 parents uh, responded to the survey, and we're really hoping to get a larger number this year, the Kansas State home usage data that's collected at iStation, trying to keep close to the microphone here, um, indicates over a million minutes of usage by 11,169 students and or parents because the home portal doesn't really tell you who's on it, just that the home portal has been opened and that the students are either using it at home or the parents are helping their students with it at home. The overall summary is that in Kansas, the students who are using iStation are performing mostly at or above national averages, with the exception of kindergarten, and I had already talked about this with you. And... Future research, uh, we will continue our analysis of these things next year. One of the things that we're doing this coming year is looking at all the districts in the state of Kansas to make the divisions into the urban, suburban, town, and rural categories. And then within each of those geographic locations, compare the schools who are not using iStation with the schools that are using iStation to see if there is an impact. Uh, with iStation districts. So that will be interesting and we'll be able to share our findings with you next year. And the schools that are not using iStation could very well be using the other. They certainly could be. And so there may be, I mean, you all always have the null hypothesis there. So it, 
certainly could be. And Steve uh, Roberts has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this uh, standalone enough where home schoolers can use it effectively? Oh, yes. All right, thank you. Did you want they there? It's not. It's not available. It's not available to homeschoolers through the contract. Oh, homeschoolers. I'm sorry. I thought you said home usage. It's homeschoolers. So uh, someone that's not enrolled in a public school doesn't have access to this, unless they under purchase the it under purchase under the contract we have. Under the contract. Under the right. contract we have. Yes, they could. Okay, but a homeschooler can can they purchase could. it for what? What kind of money are we talking about? If someone wanted to homeschool um, and use iStation. Um, we. Currently do not offer a homeschool solution uh, for an individual license, but an individual license uh, to somebody enrolled in a public or charter school uh, uh, would be in the 60 to $70 range per year. Okay, but you, you really don't have an application for homeschoolers at this time? We do not currently offer an application for homeschool at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, also, we're going to replicate our survey and uh, encourage, and with your help, perhaps we'll get many, many more. And we also want to conduct follow-up on-site focus visits with some of the schools that allow us to come. So we'll be contacting districts and ask them if they would uh, allow us to come and talk to their teachers. So uh, we're hopeful that we'll have an opportunity to do that this year. Well, we are attending several trainings across the state just so we know what they're being uh, told to do and asked to do so it, it, we can better serve them and understand our data. And that, uh, as I said, we have several missing, but um, if you have additional questions. Uh, Kathy Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't know if this will go to the iStation people or Fort Hayes. Um, but currently you had, what was the percentage of districts engaged? I wouldn't have that on the top, <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, I believe at the district level we had over 60% of districts engaged uh, with iStation at this, this year. So are you guys doing anything or do you have plans trying to recruit additional districts? Absolutely. We're actively trying uh, to inform uh, districts about what iStation offers. Uh, a lot of times when people have not heard of iStation, they believe we're just a, a digital app. They don't understand the, the research and the data and the formative assessment progress monitoring uh, that we offer as part of the program. And we find that oftentimes when we educate districts and teachers about that, there's an aha moment and they're very keen to, to try us out. But th that takes time and it takes introductions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dina Horst. Thank you. Well, my question was pretty much the same as as what Kathy's was, um, but I'll extend a little bit and ask if you have dealt with um, the centers, the service centers, who who oftentimes bring new ideas to the school districts so um, I believe that uh, one of the trainings was at Greenbush wasn't right. it yes. so well I'm Greenbush doesn't serve all the districts so no but it is a service center I'm well sure. yeah, yes are... but it's in the eastern part Thank you. and yes. I'm thinking there's there's more than one service Absolutely. center and so, so I would suggest if you're just looking at Greenbush that you need to expand that. Thank you, and we, we are and we do. And so both our professional development team and our account executives are reaching out proactively uh, to all the service centers. And I know that there was a proactive outreach just in the last few weeks to every single one of them to let them know about iStation Kansas Reading Success. Uh, and we, are, we welcome any opportunity to have dialogues with them. We consider ourselves to have good relationships with many of them. And access to this to this program is is it free to if i was reading it correctly it's it's free so it's not going to cost the district to be involved. That is absolutely right. If you are pre-K so, through eighth grade in public school or public enrollment charter school, it is absolutely 100% free. So how many of them are really knowledgeable about that? Mm -hmm. 
We, we welcome the opportunity as to well. have a conversation with as, as many of them are, are willing to give us the time. And we know, as, as has been stated earlier today, some days are just overwhelming, and to listen to one more program uh, is not something people have time for. Uh, but w but uh, please believe us when we say we'd welcome a conversation with anyone at any time about iStation and Kansas reading success. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. And just an add on to that, uh, even from the commissioner's letter that went out to all school districts that it was free. And so they should be aware of that, but it does go out multiple times to the information to them. Whether they have the chance to read or take the opportunity to read it might be a question, but it's, it's there. Okay. Ian? Of the uh, number of students that are enrolled, how, how many? How many of them, or what percentage of them, are using the uh, iStation with fidelity? I think we have it in our white paper. Dr. Sanders says she feels that they have that in their white paper. We don't have that information right off the top of their head, right off the top. With fidelity, has many um, definitions. So some of them, for example, in your survey, of course, that was not everyone who answered back that some use it for just their tier two students, some use it for just their tier three students. Our definition of fidelity changes with that. Obviously the students that are struggling the most, we expect them to use it more. Um, we, when we look at districts, their rate of usage as far as minutes on the program change from district to district. Some really use it mostly just for the assessment tool and some do use it for their struggling students and so they'll have a little bit more time. But that is some information that we can bring back to you guys. So do you, do you have that data that uh, on, the, on individual students? We, uh, that, we yeah. do. We're not really allowed to share it in that way with you guys, but we can share aggregate information about what we see in trends of usage with iStation. Is this from yours? Yeah. We do have a graph on the white paper that you'll have within a couple of days that does show um, a visual. Uh, less than half of the students enrolled use it consistently. Okay. But that's what I can say from, from looking at this right now. Okay. And so our implementation teams and our training teams, one of their big goals is to encourage usage and so and have educators understand that using it with fidelity, you're going to get the best effects. We do see a phenomena in our users nationwide that if they just use it on a good faith effort, and when I say good faith means to get started, try the program out, they start to see growth. So we share that with our educators so that they understand that it's not kind of use it with full fidelity or don't use it at all, at least try it and build it into your program, into your instructional program as you learn more about it. And that's the message that we send to them when we go out. So your, your, your uh, slide on the uh, cost per student is based on the number of students enrolled. Eligible. 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 And, the, uh, and most districts uh, with students that are well above national norms and state assessments or any um, on grade level, above grade level, most districts will use it for those students that are the most needy. So some of the students really do not use it and perhaps would not benefit from it. Yeah, I'm just trying to, the, the $5.92 five, the $5 is kind of a theoretical number. I mean, it's based on the number of kids that could use it if they wanted to, but whether or not they did, this still counted in that calculation. Okay, thank you. Randy. Ken, Ken, that was based upon the state contract that was awarded. Right. Yeah, I understand. That's the number yeah, I'm just trying to clarify that. Thank you. Ann. Yes, um, does a student have to be enrolled by their school to use this at home? I mean, how would a parent know if their kid could access it at home or not? Yes, they have to be enrolled, and you, most enrollments happen on a district-wide basis imports like many other programs the district works with our company to import their students and to have it for use we teachers are provided with information they can send to parents with the login and how to use it um, to get them started using the program so a lot of it does depend 
on the teachers or the school saying, okay, we will, we are going to ask our parents to use it at home. So that's the connection with informing the parent. And a lot of reasons that we do that is because of privacy issues and access to the accounts. We don't want other parents to get access to other students' accounts to look at their performance because when parents log in, they actually see their child's performance mm -hmm. and growth and use within iStation. So some of that comes from FERPA to keep it contained on who has access and we deliver that. The, the administrator allows the teacher to deliver that information to the parent. Okay. Dina. So by enrollment, you're talking about the teacher has specifically had that child working on the ICE station rather than the fact they're enrolled in that school district. When we look at it, our enrollment, the slides that OSHA shared with you earlier, enrollment for us is the district has enrolled the student in the ICE station through either an import or they have enrolled them into the program. And then students who have participated would be how we define they're actually on the pro program and have assessment usage and curricular usage. So enrollment is we actually have their student name, their ID, they have a login. Whether they use it or not would be participation. Sure, okay, thanks. See no more questions. We thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate it, thank uh, you very and much. I would encourage uh, looking at better ways to communicate because sometimes we weren't real responsible in passing things well, off. We like understand today, completely. We'll, we, we will try everything that we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you and I'll be back next year. One more question. Is it possible to know what the average daily login is? As far as students in Kansas that are using it, just I'm sure you know who's logged in and yes. see those numbers. Uh, yes, I believe so. I, we just need to check with privacy laws, but we have that information. We don't have it with us today, but we absolutely can see exactly who's logging in on. Well, a, I know how many you basis. have enrolled. Mm -hmm. That really doesn't tell me, you know, who's using it on a daily basis okay. for their classroom. So if we we'd be happy, we'd be more than happy. A hundred students that or a hundred thousand. I want to and see the trend. Sure trend we might show you by month some kind of looking at in the month of August this many enrolled this is the average daily usage maybe you know with September it will trickle off this time of year because there's other things going on in the schools it, you will see it trickle off around state testing time but I believe we can give it to you in a form that answers your question okay, thanks. Absolutely. and how far can you drill down legally legally with you guys we could I think we can do um, an average as a state, we might be able to do regions. We'd have to get some of that clarified with us, meaning regions as in rural, suburban, urban, what's the average. Um, in our world, we can get down to all the individual data that we need, but how we share it, we just I'm not asking to violate the law, but I'd like to have it drilled down as far as possible. <laughs> Just that's so you all our, know, that's, that's not, our, that's not within know. our program. <laughs> but, but just a plug for, for how it can be helpful to the teachers. The teachers not only see the login, but they see every single click if they want to that a student makes. So they know if the student's going click, 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 or uh, sort of ignoring the program altogether and has idle time. Uh, and so the teacher can get down to the exact minutia of exactly what the student is seeing and how they're using the program. Uh, so we do have and capture that data, and then we just need to roll it up at a level that's appropriate for the state. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Anything else? Let's move ahead. We're looking forward to hearing from Luann and John. It's all yours, guys. Hello, Brian. Well, hello. Uh, good morning. I'm Brian Jordan, uh, Director of Leadership Services for the Kansas Association of School Boards. And uh, our organization is the one that put together the personnel report that John and Luann are going to walk you through this morning or they're going to walk through kind of their next steps uh, after having received the report. Um, they asked me to just come up and kind of introduce the general framework of that and then I'm going to turn it over to them for them to share their kind of their next steps and plans to how to use the information. Uh, so we were contacted in late August or mid-August to conduct a personnel study and it really started out with two uh, core focus areas. The first one was uh, to review the current administrative structure of the School for the Deaf and the School for the Blind here in Kansas. 
Uh, that part of the study was conducted through interviews with those folks that were in supervisory or administrative roles. And then we also did a review of their job descriptions for those positions. The second part of the study is uh, the, was to study similar sized types of districts and schools nationwide. Uh, and that was actually conducted through reaching out uh, to the Council of Schools for Services of Blind and the Conference of Educational Administrators of Schools and Programs for the Deaf. And we worked with their leadership uh, boards and each of those organizations and, some, and, and uh, vetted a survey out through those schools and got feedback on types of services they perform, uh, age of students receiving services, uh, super, basically different types of positions that they had at those schools. And then the, the third piece of the study really uh, we put together after conversation with uh, John and Luann, uh, and it was really more of a stakeholder perception and planning session with uh, representatives from each of those two schools. We ended up with about 40 to 50 folks participating. It was over two sessions, so the numbers varied a little bit there, but I uh, really asked them to take a look at what their current strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are, a SWOT analysis, and then talk about what they see as focus areas for planning and improvement efforts going forward. And again, I emphasize that that was done with mostly stakeholders that, that were external to the schools. So people that uh, utilize their services, parents, uh, local business folks, people that are uh, you know, supporters of those schools. So that was the framework of the study that we put together. I believe you all have a copy of the report uh, that we submitted. Uh, as we put that together, we put it together with uh, ideas and considerations. And obviously that information has to be taken and you know, looked at by the respective leadership of the schools and you all and to determine how to use it appropriately going forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to John and Luann if there's no further questions. Okay. Good morning. I um, wanted to acknowledge the board chair and the board for having us here today. To, um, as um, Brian, Dr. Jordan pointed out, uh, this report is in front of you. Um, we're very pleased that uh, CASB took the time and, and Dr. Jordan took the time to do this. It's, it's critical for us and, and it's welcome. Um, we uh, I also want to thank the commissioner for taking so much time to meet with Luann and me. Um, I know how precious his time is and we were very grateful for, for that time. KSSB's vision is the right help at the right time and the right location and uh, for students who are visually impaired, which is, I think, what this report really is, is asking for us to do. It speaks to our goal to be uh, flexible, creative, and meeting the needs when and where they exist. The need for core academic instruction for kids who are visually impaired is, is real but so is the need for the expanded core curriculum. These are things like independent living, social skills, braille, assistive technology, cane skills, career ed, rec and leisure. These are not really just extras, but they're the difference between independence and um, total reliance um, on paid supports. Um, Parents want their children to have access to instruction in all of these areas and so they can have the same opportunities as all other students. Schools in Kansas do great work in meeting the diverse needs of, of children, including those who are visually impaired. But meeting, um, but if we're to realize the board's vision of uh, leading the world in the success of each student, we believe that KSSB should have an expanded role and be used in a greater capacity than what it is currently. This report points us in that direction and really affirms the small steps that we have taken already. Stronger leadership, better relationships, more outreach, and a focus on student outcomes. Uh, before Loanne speaks, uh, just uh, an overview. We uh, will present uh, the considerations, the summary considerations that, that came out of the report from CASB and give our response to those. And I'll let Loanne speak. Um, I noticed that the PowerPoint is not up on the screen. Did you put it on there? 
um, go ahead and start. I'm going to uh, talk about our philosophy for the Kansas School for the Deaf. For the last 20 years, we've participated in national research projects that have um, focused on the most effective instruction for students who are deaf or hard of hearing. That has allowed Kansas School for the Deaf to be on the cutting edge of education reform in deaf and hard of hearing education. We've also served as a model program for other schools throughout the country. As a bilingual school, the Kansas School for the Deaf has continued to strengthen ASL and English bilingual programming with focus on developing language and academic performance in both languages, ASL and English. That would include reading, writing, listening, and spoken English. Not only students know ASL, but they also benefit from instruction from spoken English and listening opportunities. With the emphasis in developing ASL in English, the ultimate goal is for our students to be successful socially, cognitively, and academically, to have the advantage to um, be able to accrue their growth. The ultimate goal for all of our students who are deaf or hard of hearing is to be proficient in both languages. That process of how those languages develop varies depending on how early a child acquires language. The frequency of the use of the language has an impact on social and academic development for those purposes. KSD maintains that our focus is always on the linguistic needs of each student and where those students' needs are most met and the effectiveness of those needs, regardless of age or where the student is in the state. Our intent is to support students by providing placement options with a school-based program, either in Olathe and then also with outreach with families throughout the state to ensure that students are having their needs met, both developmentally and linguistically meeting the milestones that students can be ready for kindergarten. The progress should be appropriate to their age and their social and emotional development we want them to have that world knowledge so that they can have more opportunities in the job market, and then that also affects them in their post-secondary work. So if you look at the first slide, this is really um, the first uh, consideration that came out of the report, which is the redesign of the administrative structure. And we agree with the report in that resource, resources should be spent as much as possible on student services and supports. In KSSB's case, we began this effort to move resources from campus to regional locations in earnest three years ago. It's important to note that KSSB's regional staff are providing both direct services and uh, technical assistance and expertise to other professionals in the field. We believe that a stronger outreach program does not diminish, but rather benefits our campus programs by increasing the awareness uh, among schools and parents about the range of services and supports that a student might need to complement his or her existing services. And uh, just one example of what might be possible through those reductions in, in administrative services or positions we really could be more proactive in, in addressing the critical needs in birth to three uh, by hiring an early childhood uh, specialist and slash teacher, the visually impaired, who could help the 36 Part C networks um, across the state to identify, refer, and, and serve infants who are visually impaired. This would be a, a more proactive and effective model than what we currently do. On the uh, second bullet point on this slide, um, we mentioned the superintendents for both of the schools. Since the vision and the philosophy of both schools is unique to the populations that we serve and the cultures that are involved in those populations, Mr. Harding and I are recommending that each school have their own superintendent. 
the superintendent for each school would determine the direction and the leadership and set the tone while responding to the needs of individual students, parents, educators, and professionals, as well as the community at large. With the superintendent at each school, we do recognize a cost savings, meaning that there would not be a need for assistant superintendents and that would eliminate one position. Both of the superintendents could focus on the vision and the needs of their respective school. The focus would not be diminished. Instead, there would be more quality services, quality time spent in e on each campus and enhancements to outreach and field services. We would absorb additional administrative responsibilities and that would uh, give us a cost savings with reduced administration. In reference to the letter from the Kansas Association of the Deaf and the um, Kansas Community Action Plan, they are also recommending two superintendents. Their desire is to have a superintendent who is the face of the organization and that is an actual rep representation of the population they serve. This was also mentioned at the stakeholders meeting where both groups had indicated a preference for each school's leadership to have expertise in that field. Either deaf or hard of hearing or visually impaired, low vision. We are mindful of the challenges that both schools would experience charting that course We would maintain um, unity in developing our strategic plan. Both schools would continue to share resources in order to achieve a be the best result for our students, our families, and for uh, teachers. With two superintendents, that would pose a significant challenge with our sh for our shared staff in order to address that and your concerns about the lack of possible coordination or um, duplication of services with the superintendent at each school, we are proposing that the Kansas Department of Education staff assist with um, periodic and frequent overview of the tier four uh, grouping of staff as mentioned on page 13 in the report. In order to optimize efficiency and ensure that services are parallel to both schools. The second, excuse me. As far as the Kansas School for the Deaf and the needs for families and districts, that has changed um, throughout the year. So I'm going to go over some history of our outreach work later in the presentation. The outreach team has adjusted and shifted their responsibilities to address the most needs throughout the state. In the stakeholders report and throughout the meeting, um, there was mention of expanding services and outreach throughout the state, providing education educators with professional development, and that's considered to be um, significant. So three of those administrative positions that were recommended to be reduced in the report could be um, transferred to outreach and that is my intent to expand the outreach department at the Kansas School for the Deaf. We'll move on to the, uh, the second uh, general consideration in the report. The recommendation is to, um, again, to move resources to outreach. That came through very clearly in the report. Um, and if you look at this first map, this shows a, a very conservative estimate of the number of students with visual impairments age uh, 3 through 21 by regions of the state. Uh, this data comes from the Kansas Instructional Resource Center, which is located actually on our campus. Uh, KSSB currently does not have permission to access the data specifics, however, um, which could allow us to provide more targeted information about the unique vision services programs and supports that parents and or districts may not be aware of. Um, better access to this sort of data would be one way to increase assistance to students and families and better utilize KSSB as a state resource. Uh, the second map shows the number of students with visual impairments who are provided direct services by KSSB field services staff currently. This really is a significant in increase from years past. 
Um, I've mentioned previously in my last visit here that we're providing a week-long summer school uh, experience at Fort Hayes State University this summer for the first time. We have expanded the Braille Challenge to Wichita last year, and we're also conducting low vision clinics in our regional locations. Um, our regional field service staff have focused on building strong relationships with TVIs across the state, teachers of the visually impaired across the state, and I'm making an emphasis uh, on attending the special ed director's meetings with our regional field services staff across the state. Another idea that we would like to explore, uh, when a child is first identified in this state with a visual impairment, KSSB might be a required contact to provide information to parents and teams regarding these resources, best practices, et cetera. Other states do this to good effect, and we believe this is one area that the board and, and the Department of Ed might, might be able to assist us. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. are the number of people on birth through 21. Actually, th age three through 21. 21 who have. Who are identified as visually impaired. visually impaired. Right. What are the next? There are a whole lot fewer get receiving services. <laughs> from, from the school so for the blind. What, is what, what's, what's happening to the others? Right. Many of the students who are identified are, are served by others who are not, not employees of the School for the Blind. So um, sir, uh, cooperatives and school districts do hire their own teachers of the visually impaired and certified orientation mobility specialists. And that's where the, the direct service part, um, uh, they provide the direct service in those cases. And that's where we can provide that technical assistance. So we can provide um, uh, mentorship, that coaching. Mean they're not getting services. Right. They're just not getting services. Right. These numbers reflect what, what our school is providing in terms of direct services. Thank you for that clarification. I wanted to um, take the opportunity today to also give some history of outreach and the programming um, that has been happening there, and it has grown exponentially. Um, Forty years ago, in 1977, the Board of Education requested that the Kansas School for the Deaf manage the first ever um, ATU project, Auditory Training Unit Project, or FM system, through the Kansas School for the Deaf. And an FM system will remove environmental sounds from an environment that a student is so that they can hear um, the information and the instruction directly from the teacher. Once that program started, the outreach depart department started providing more services throughout the state, and that led to um, providing comprehensive evaluations. And then in 1989, the Kansas School for the Deaf initiated the Birth to Three program that provided more um, services throughout Wyandotte and Johnson County through the Hartley Family Center at KU. In 1995, there were more requests for evaluations and so there was an obvious need um, throughout the state. In 2004, the outreach department expanded further their, their um, birth to 21 program. And then they also increased supports for uh, Sound Start Birth to Three. And that was in collaboration with the Department of Health and Environment. And that um, has been happening since 2007. In 2011, the outreach team um, conducted a purposeful survey throughout the state in order to establish their strategic plan. And that was based on the information received from parents and districts and service providers. Based on the survey results, um, they learned that more professional development was needed throughout the state for um, students who were educators excuse me, teachers that were educators, students who received direct services. In 2013, there was a collaboration with um, TASN to establish the Teacher of the Deaf grant. And that program is currently up and running through Valdosta State University in Georgia. And there are 15 students at this time enrolled in that program. Uh, when the program started, of course, we had zero. And that's to uh, try and address the need for teachers of the deaf throughout the state. In 2014, the Sound Start program expanded to include a part-time early interventionist. 
and able to per, in order to provide more direct services to infants birth to three. And then an audiologist was added in 2015 and recently became full-time. And early intervention specialist has been added this year also. And we will soon be hiring a parent-to-parent -parent coordinator. So that program is definitely expanding. With um, SB 323, which is now called KSA 75397E, um, the advisory committee that was established from that will be making recommendations to the legislature to have the Kansas School for the Deaf run that language assessment program statewide. And so that will be an additional responsibility that outreach will undertake. This map um, has this year's numbers from 2015 to 2017. We have provided 328 services throughout the state. And that has been consultation and evaluation, and that includes um, students that receive more than one service. So it would not include students who attend, or people who uh, attend professional development or workshops. And does not include uh, the number of students on our campus-based program, which is 135 at this time. This next map. is a breakdown of students who receive um, services throughout Kansas for the Family Science Kansas program, which is an online American Sign Language course court course that students can take who um, do not live in the Johnson County area. So it's intended for students living outside the areas. We've had 25 students in that class, and we've had nine enrolled this year, and that number grows every year. And the um, we use... Uh, TIF money to implement that program and run that program. This HAT program refers to the auditory training units. We currently have 312 receivers that are loaned out throughout the state in different school districts for their students which, to, which um, amounts to 186 students. This last week, we received five new requests um, for those units to be leased. And that number increases at a fast rate, and we're expecting more requests for the rest of this year. Ann has a question. Thank you. On, I'm so, are there many students who have hearing issues a, um, who are getting services other than from the School for the Deaf, what does that population look like? We do not have an exact number of the students throughout the state, and one of our recommendations is to ask the board for their assistance in establishing a database. We usually um, will say there's approximately 700 students throughout the state, and that's an estimate. We do not have an accurate number of deaf or hard of hearing students. We know on campus we have 135 and we know that we serve more than 400 throughout the state. Um, due to some students being on a 504 and other students being on an IEP and then other students who just are not um, documented or mislabeled. Um, so we do need assistance in obtaining an accurate number so that we can ensure that we are ser serving every student throughout the state. So. Um there's something in the neighborhood of 300 students we know of that are not being served by our services. Is that about right? If um, we do not know that. We don't have that exact number. I know that the school districts are doing their best to provide services to students. However, some students are overlooked because they are able to speak well and appear to be able to hear well. So they may not be identified with a mild hearing loss. Um, if they are identified with a mild hearing loss, um, they, of course, would be able to receive additional services, but that wouldn't be as extensive as a student with a profound loss. So is there a requirement? Here's showing you my 
ignorance on this topic, but is there um, a requirement for a hearing test in public schools? There is a newborn hearing screening mm -hmm. that takes place um, right after a child is born right. to help identify that, and that happens through the Sound Beginnings program. Mm -hmm. And that is a law that's um, been enacted that all babies born in the state of Kansas go through that screening. And the data that comes from that screening does not continue after the age of three. And so there, uh, we need more um, collaboration between the Department of Health and the Department of Ed to get those numbers after the age of three. Okay. Thank you. Kathy Bush. Oh, were you through, Ann? Just kind of a follow-up question to that. Um, do you have access to the number of students who are identified as hearing impaired through an IEP or a 504 type of a plan? We do not have um, access to school district information or data. And that's another one of our recommendations that we need um, your assistance with being able to get those numbers from the Department of Ed. At this point, um, the only numbers that we're aware of that are exact that we are currently serving are in the range of three to 400 students, um, including our on-campus students. And so we're aware that there are students we aren't serving. Either um, they have a TOD in their district and their needs are met without any concern, but again, we don't have um, access to that data. So if you did, that could help as far as expanding your outreach services and having greater knowledge of those students? Absolutely, it would. John Bacon. Thank you. Um, Lynn, the... Um outreach that showed the services provided map showed 348 services provided how many students did that involve I do not have that exact number um, that's a data area that we do need to improve in I did ask that of our outreach director and at this point they only keep track of the number of services mm -hmm. provided not the number of students and so they will begin tracking that okay. um, at this point, the estimate is about 400. And that's through a variety of different services, and that includes indirect services. For example, um, there's a district um, that the special ed department has contacted us, and they have 52 students. However, there may be one service for those 52 students. So that one um, service that's provided would have an impact on that number of students. A horse. So, all of like the hearing assistive technology and other services that you provide um, are to students who um, the district, the uh, cooper the cooperative or whomever provides special services is asking you for that assistance. And the yes. possibility then is that you do not receive um, requests for some, some students or from some districts. Correct. There are some districts, however, who may not even have a deaf or hard of hearing student in their district, so they would have no reason to make a request. Correct. So the information that I've shared today comes from districts that have contacted us and requested services. For example, if you look at the um, HAT information on the slide, it appears as though there, is, there isn't anything in western Kansas. However, they have audiologists in that area and they've purchased their own equipment, so they've not had a need. Um, for the FM or ATU assistance from us so because they provide their own equipment and their own staff. Um, 
um, Oakley and other districts have their own audiologists and um, provide those services. The rest of the districts throughout the state would contact us and ask for assistance. Okay. It's kind of what I suspected, but thank you. Uh, John. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up on my other question. Um, so let's say Hayes has a couple of students that need services. You drive out there. Now, does the School for the Deaf, do they charge Hayes for that, or do they get reimbursed, or how do you des determine who's paying for this service? We do drive out to Hayes, and we uh, do not charge districts. The only thing that we charge districts for is if they um, want a student to come in for a comprehensive evaluation we charge three hundred dollars per day and that's a three-day evaluation the rest of the services are free of charge for the um, ATU program we do charge to lease the program but we don't charge for um, transportation or travel um, to the district so we try to keep those costs as low as possible um, so that there's less burden on the district um, we're very sensitive and aware of the fact that we just want to get the support to the students in the district we don't want cost to prohibit that so like on this one here the hearing assistance technology those those devices those are free that you send out around the state but as far as the training needed to use them properly that's in addition or is that free too you have to go around and help everyone figure out how to use it we charge to lease the equipment. Okay. However, the training, um, the, tra the uh, travel, we have one audiologist who does travel the state and provide the training and the, uh, she goes out and drops off the equipment, she goes and picks it up and when she drops it off she provides training with, to the staff that's responsible for working with the student. If it needs to be replaced or if it needs to be broken, um, it comes in, the audiologist repairs it immediately and sends it right back out so that the student has continued access to instruction um, through auditory means. Um, for outreach, ages three, t was there another question? Ages. Are you through with your presentations? Uh, I'd like to add my name when they get done. Not now, but later. <laughs> well, I keep getting knocked off on my hand waving too. <laughs> So you're going to hold your question, right? All right. For um, outreach, um, ages 3 to 21, obviously um, we need to improve our data in that area related to um, students receiving indirect services. For birth to three, which is our infant and toddler program, <clears throat> that's represented here since 2015, we have had 130 contacts since April of 2017 the number of um, students served in Johnson County has doubled and currently we're serving 43 infants and toddlers and we just hired um, a new full-time early intervention specialist and her caseload is already filling up we want to uh, be able to serve more infants and toddlers in the western part of the state and so we'll need additional staff um, to support those families. And so again, um, I'm hoping that this is evidence of the expansion of the outreach team. And we are grateful for this study because it did um, put us in a position to look at the actual areas of need and expand in our outreach department and gave us the ability to be able to uh, reallocate positions into outreach. try to move through these last three recommendations uh, fairly quickly. Um, recommendation number three was expand a collaboration with cooperatives, interlocals, and, and higher education. KSSB recognizes that we need to provide greater value to special ed cooperatives, local education agencies, and interlocals across the state. This really begins with an understanding and the premise 
that we honor the work that they do, respect the challenges that they face, and have a sincere desire to help them better meet um, the needs of students with visually impaired in their charge when and if they need it. And that means preferably in their home, their home schools. We want and need uh, KSDE and the board to know this too so that we're all working in concert to bring our unique and combined strengths to bear for the benefit of students. In many ways, we try to emulate what the Technical Assistance Systems Network, TAS, and uh, what they do in their model. And uh, we could really use probably some help marketing and promoting our services, however. I think that's become clear, and I think that report points this out. We're especially grateful to the Department of Ed for providing the fin uh, financial support that allows us to play a role in the recruitment and development of new vision professionals via higher education training programs. Uh, since our last visit here, we have made overtures to a local university here in Kansas to determine if we might develop a training program for TVIs, teachers of visually impaired, or orientation and a mobility specialist here locally. Um, the need for O&Ms is especially acute in this state. And I think cooperatives and districts could use more help in providing this service. Some of those numbers I showed you earlier for direct services, most of those are around orientation and mobility because of the acute need. Um, we'd like to, to also hire, again, an early childhood specialist and work with Part C. I think that's critical and one way that we can reallocate those resources that were spent formerly on administrators into student services. Well, I had a response um, immediately after our remarks at, at last board presentation um, expressing an interest in dialogue, so we've set up an appointment to begin talking about what that would look like. We're grateful for those universities out of state that we partner with, um, but it, it would make more sense, I think, to work with local universities in terms of recruitment of teachers. kind of a follow-up on the same thing. Um, I understand that the teachers of visually impaired would need graduate level course, probably baccalaureate type work, but what about the communication and mobility specialists? Is that college required or is that training capability? It, it's always others folks. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are a couple different doors into the profession uh, for orientation mobility specialists. That's always at an institute of higher education requires graduate level work and so usually those are teachers who uh, have decided they want to pursue work outside of the classroom with special needs students uh, kids who are visually impaired does that answer your question I will um, try to shorten this a little bit we are currently exploring different ways to uh, collaborate with families uh, and, and provide those supports. The outreach has been doing that. However, we would like to expand um, outreach to districts who have not contacted us or districts who may not even know that we're here. Um, we are currently considering what's be already being provided and what areas we need to expand in, and we definitely would be offering um, more training, um, camps, experiences, family events um, off of campus. We know that the Kansas School for the Deaf is located in the eastern part of the state, and so we're very sensitive to the distance and the driving time and the hardship that would cause for families and, and what the, what it, how it would affect districts. And so we're trying to establish more out into, out into the state. We're also um, looking at a deaf mentor program. We have funding from the Department of Health and Environment through the Sound Start program uh, to establish a deaf mentor program. And that would be statewide. And the purpose is to help families and agencies in implementing bilingual, bicultural home environments and programs for children who are deaf or hard of hearing. More and more of the sites would be center-based so that um, parents wouldn't have to drive a long distance to get to the school-based program. And for um, the Birth to Three program, we have a very strong relationship with the Department of Health and Environment, 
and we are wanting to uh, increase that relationship for ages three to five. In the area of three to five, as far as school districts, we um, are wanting them to be able to have a critical mass, and that would be a critical net mass or a sufficient number of students within their district. And so we're doing a study of that to see if it's feasible to set up um, or establish a satellite program that would be in different parts of the state. KSD is not a placement option, obviously, for students that are three to five years old because of the distance and their young age. And so we want to be able to support families um, when their children are that young, especially with language development, acquisition, social emotional development, and cognitive development. We're also considering a plan to implement and support um, the possibility of a regional outreach program with the Kansas School for the Deaf um, as the hub for that program. Um, similar to what John said, um, the teacher prep program, there is not one that exists in this state, but we've had some informal conversation with different universities um, to establish a program in this state. Through our partnership with um, the out-of-state universities, that has been um, a nice opportunity, but it would be great to have one within the state, of course. Same question. How responsive are the universities to that request? Um, I was approached as well. Um, I think the same university approached me as well as um, that approached John, and I let them know that I would um, be able to get back with them and have a discussion with them about that. There is one university that we've started um, preliminary com conversations with, but the feasibility um, may not be there. It's a smaller town and maybe more of a challenge for them to deliver a deaf ed program, so that's very much in the air still. As I mentioned um, earlier, we would like for your assistance in um, developing a database in order to know the exact number of students throughout the state and would like to um, strengthen our current relationship with birth to three and um, three to five. Included in that effort would be the Department of Ed's presence um, at every uh, IEP meeting or 504 meeting a KSD representative being there to be able to locate and work with the TODs throughout the state. So that's um, the goals of outreach and those efforts with districts and co-ops. The KASB report asked um, both schools to address opportunities for the schools to work collaboratively with shared staff between the Kansas School for the Blind and the Kansas School for the Deaf. So I'm going to address um, the ways that we are mindful that we can do that. We are mindful that both of our populations are different. Effective instruction is at the heart of what both schools do. We want to be able to promote strategies that work for all of our students at both schools we want to be able to address the functional behavioral assessment um, training for both parents and staff. Both schools have excellent teachers that have expertise and many years of experience um, in, these, in both of these programs. We can provide more support through the listserv, through um, webinars. We currently have independent living programs at both schools. We want to be able to promote um, that relationship with both communities. We have expanded learning opportunities um, from each other in many different areas. Both schools um, have students with additional disabilities, so those are resources that we could share. If a student um, is deaf or blind, but the student may have autism, that's something that we can um, share resources with. And both schools uh, um, house expertise in deafness and blindness at the School for the Blind is the Deaf Blind Project, and at the School for the Deaf is the Helen Keller National Center. And so we have that internal and external expertise that's available to us. The last
last recommendation um, talks about assisting students in their transition to life after leaving our schools. And I think that's, that's really, really important for us. Um, ASSB has a transition specialist who is able to uh, visit students' home schools and communities before, during, and after placement at our school. But we do need to expand this service. Our field services team also provide pre- and post-transition assistance to students who navigate from our school to their home schools, adult agencies, work placements, or, or college. We recognize we have to get much better at job development and understanding the needs of businesses in students' home communities. And we need less handing off of information and a more hands-on approach to assuring that our students can live, work, and, and learn in their community of choice. This means uh, really walking the neighborhoods where our students will return to visit businesses, rec centers, day programs, schools, colleges, and meeting with parents in, in their homes. We're learning about customized employment approaches to better serve students who need help advocating for themselves. We are applying to be a vendor uh, for voc rehab services, which would allow us to provide technology, mobility, work assessment for Kansas students who are visually impaired ages 18 to 22 who want to work. Currently, these students are referred to agencies uh, outside the state of Kansas. And finally, we need help marketing our existing transition program for students who have met their academic requirements for graduation, but who need to develop work skills, independent living skills, and or who want to get a taste of college success, but just need a little bit of help. This program that we currently have is, I believe, really underutilized and would be more popular if, if parents and schools knew that it existed. From the KASB report, um, an area that was highlighted was our current K-STAR program, which stands for Kansas Students uh, and Readiness Program. And this is for uh, students who have completed their graduation requirements and they're over the age of 18 and they're eligible until the age of 21. Again, they've completed the requirements necessary to get their diploma. However, they have additional needs and skills um, that they've not yet developed to exit the program. So the K-STAR program is intended to keep them uh, for several more years if needed uh, for further education and training. And it's to increase their independent living skills, their employment skills, and college readiness. Uh, to know how to advocate for themselves and to be able to live in an apartment setting and receive um, academic support. The students that qualify for this program are anyone that lives in the state of Kansas between the ages of 18 and 21, again, who have met their academic um, requirements for graduation. These are students who may, addition, who may need additional training and experience. In order to prepare for college, they can go through the TIPS program at Johnson County Community College um, which would give them post-secondary experience. The amount of time that a student can stay in the program can be anywhere from one quarter um, until the time that they age out. At the completion of the program, that's determined by um, their satisfaction with the skills that they've acquired or they come to the recognition that they're ready um, to leave to go into the workforce or move on to post-secondary life. Um, we, of course, recognize that it's paramount for parents and school districts to be included in the transition planning. The uh, more that that happens, the more chance of success there is for students. We're currently revamping our um, career curriculum at the secondary level, and that would be for 7th to 12th graders. Our first step is to identify the core career skills, content, and social and emotional skills that are needed. And we're currently working on developing those priorities. And that would give us an integrated delivery model, meaning that our content area would be integrated um, with career focus and not seen as two separate um, areas to work on. 
looking at individual uh, plans of study. We've um, started that. However, we've moved the time back to when students start focusing to sixth grade instead of seventh grade. And we are um, very close to a local high school, which is Olathe North, so we have dual placement opportunities. If a student is interested in a specific career cluster that we don't offer at the School for the Deaf, um, students can attend there. And we um, pay for the interpreting costs for that if the student is not already an Olathe student. We are becoming more and more focused on family engagement. Um, families usually will attend an IEP meeting once a year, but that is not enough time um, to spend with families. And so our uh, IEP coordinator will be meeting individually with families after the IEP meeting on a student's transition plan. So that's in process now. Uh, in closing, we have uh, want to thank you for listening, first of all. We've listened to what our stakeholders have said. They want better marketing of our schools. They want students to leave our schools empowered and prepared. They want us to improve and expand our partnerships and increase community-based learning. And they want us to recruit and retain high-quality instructors. We believe this report really can be the impetus for honest dialogue, self-reflection, and a commitment to finding new ways to provide help to districts and teachers who are working really very hard under difficult circumstances. We believe our recent challenges, uh, changes that we have en enacted align with the board's vision and we want to closely emulate the leadership and the direction that the special ed team at the Department of Ed under the direction of Colleen Riley, who I think is here today, uh, that they provide to special education leaders and teachers across the state. We know the board wants uh, efficient and strong leadership safe kids and schools that are prepared to take risks and find new ways, new partnerships to make sure students have what they need to follow their own dreams. The ideas presented today are only a sampling of what, what we're exploring. Our schools are ready to make these changes and we really humbly ask for your support. In closing, we want you to, to know that we're assembling a representative group of stakeholders to implement these recommendations under your guidance and support again. Uh, we thank you for your time this morning and we certainly welcome your questions. This is Cassandra Brunner. Tell me how many students each of you have at on your campus and how many of those are residential and how many of them are day students? And the ballpark is good. Yeah, we, we currently have about 25 students on our campus and about half of those are residential, or ex what we call the extended day program. And how? How young is your youngest residential student? We don't typically put students or um, ask parents to place their students in the dormitory under the age of 10. There is some variability in that, but rarely under the age of 10. Okay, so they have the same question. Uh, part of the two to five. We currently have 135 students on campus at, at this point, and half of that number live in the dorm. We do accept um, students as young as age five. Several years ago, uh, we changed that number. Initially, it was age seven. However, we had requests from families to send them at the age of five so they could acquire language. And so uh, that was the reason that we reduced that number. Thank you. Dina. Uh, no, I won't. <laughs> She's going to take longer. <laughs> Maybe. Um, you were talking about transition of services, and if I heard correctly that some of that doesn't begin until they're almost ready to, to leave the school. Um, what do you do with students that are 10, for example, or five, normally, we as parents provide some sort of, of more, ind we expect independence to begin at a certain age, and it's not total independence, but working up to uh, independence. So what are you doing? I didn't hear anything until it sounded like all of a sudden you get to be a certain age and 
we decide you need some transition uh, skills. And so um, I'd like to, I can't believe you're not doing some of that previously. So I'd like to uh, know what each of you are doing. I appreciate the question. I certainly didn't uh, mean to leave you the impression we're not, not doing anything. What I was referring to in particular was students who come to our 18 to 22 year old program and then return home to, to their small community or rural, rural community. And it is difficult at times to begin to, to make that transition for them, to prepare them for life even after they've learned these great skills. In, in, in reference to your, your point about what are we doing at early ages, all students who come to our school receive instruction in independent, independent living, self-determination, these sorts of things that will lead to uh, more likelihood of independence later on. And I think one of the things we, we need to do a better job of is educating parents, frankly. We've had extensive discussions about ways that we can educate parents and the things that they're doing at home to promote um, independence, self-determination, it's a really critical thing. So we're beginning to explore that and we've done some training in parent education at our Braille Challenge and as well as some of our Boys and Girls Weekend, but we'd like to do more of that. Good afternoon, Scott. My answer would be similar um, to John's response. We actually start independent living training, so to speak, um, in early childhood where we talk about different types of careers. You know, when kids are little, they say, I want to be a police officer. I want to be a firefighter when I grow up. And so um, we build from that. But more official um, plans of study and the courses of study begin um, in seventh grade. And we plan this fall to change that to begin in the sixth grade because we want students to be able to lead their own transition plan and their own transition meetings. And uh, we think that that's there and very good and will happen, but we would like to have more um, parent engagement. And so that's an area that we're working on. Okay, Scott. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I might be a little lengthy, and I'm sorry, but I've got three different areas I'm concerned about. First of all, being on this board, I've always been concerned about our relationship with this board and um, the two schools. And so I very much appreciate the report, Brian. All it did is make me embarrassed, but um, as being a board member for these two, I think we've We've missed the communication, and which brings up to me my thought of when you were doing this report, did you ever look at our structure of when they go to the legislature, when they come to us, if uh, there's any tweaking we need to do? I know uh, last year we had a problem with going to the legislature before they came here. I think that was just another example of the lack of where do these two go when they need help? Do they come to us or when? And I'm not real sure we as a board or, or the two leaders even understand um, where that is. And did you address any of that in, in this board report? I did not take a look at what that process looks like. Uh, they do have to submit their individual budgets to the legislature, and, and I know there's ongoing communication that happens with you, but we did not look at the timing of how those two things come together. Um, in one of the structures that, that we recommended, um, the operations component that is shared individuals, uh, we shifted some things around because of communication with the two leaders. It, we, we felt like that would help improve some of the communication if some of those operation components were shifted to a different level of leadership and, and they, there had to be better communication between those. But we didn't take a look at the legislature, state board, and these two schools' communication processes. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, as a board member, it would help me. Um, we've, we're better than what we were, but maybe um, we all sitting down and having that structural conversation might be very helpful. I also know that we have a liaison from our board to um, 
the deaf and to the um, school of the blind. I'm not real sure we're using these liaisons in the highest capacity that we could use them. I know mostly they go at, and they hand out diplomas, but maybe if they could serve on some of these, I don't know what committee they need to, to attend to bring back board reports to us that might be helpful in, in the whole structure. I think we've got a structure problem here. Um, and I don't know where the problem is, okay? And, and evidently the report didn't, didn't do that. Okay, I want to move on into a different part. That was the structure part and, um, uh, of that. Are, you, are both of you attending the um, superintendent's meetings? I'll, I'll take that question. I do uh, attend the superintendent's forum that's sponsored by CASB, as well as the Council of Superintendents, which is also held at, at the CASB offices. I'm not sure if, if CASB sponsors that or not, but I have been attending both of those reg regularly. I have been attending um, the Council of Superintendents meetings on a monthly basis. I, I uh, think that's right. As far right. as the superintendent's forum, um, that may be something that I need to consider. Well, I, I'm talking about the monthly superintendent meetings. I think, um, is that the council, Randy? Okay. I, I think that's where um, a lot of our superintendents get what we're doing and the vision, and I really appreciated uh, both of the reports on how you're trying to, to meet that vision. Um, I really think that we as a board are um, missing our goal of each individual child by how we are all working together, and it goes back to that structure. I think we can work smarter and have better communication and understand each other a little better. I did appreciate both of you saying that it's very important for your students to um, learn how to work in the real world and not be isolated. And I think that's very strong. You know, that's the basis of, of special ed on inclusion. And, and I really like that. I really like your philosophy of my students not having to travel across the state to get the services they need but they can still be part of their family. And I, I think that's very important because I've seen family structures be um, ruined by special needs. And um, that's important, so I really like that. Now, I'm gonna tell you what I heard that you need help with. And if I leave something out or if I include something that's wrong, I want you to, to tell me. I heard that maybe this board could help you if you would come to us on the schools of education in including programs for the deaf and hard of hearing. That I think that's probably our job to help you with that. And that um, you don't need help with licensure, but you need help with education and professional development. I also heard that you need help with the data collection. And um, I heard you loud and clear, Luann. My goodness, we have fallen. It, that's really sad, the numbers that we don't have to work with. I also liked your transition idea because it, it fits our social and emotional target. I also heard that you um, might need some help in marketing. And so I would turn to Randy at this time, and with Diane DeBacker being part of the governor's work with the business and in innovation, maybe we could slip something in her ear that we could use some help with the businesses in uh, deaf and, and the blind. Maybe she would be a kind partner to help us with that. And then last of all, because I know we have to make a decision on this, you two are recommending 
the plan of each school having their own superintendent that you two can work together and we don't necessarily need another administrator that you can work together to um, and maybe that what I'm what I'm seeing in vision of that is if we if you have this council or you have you know I don't know some organizational level that you guys meet with with the liaisons and your I don't know figure it out <laughs> I think you get the idea of, of the structure I'm thinking that I could see where something like that might be possible and um, and and working um, I also see that in the past that maybe we have um, well I'm not going to go there um, that's that is what I report out of what I heard Mr. Chairman and my recommendations to us as a board on trying to solve maybe some of these and what I've seen and um, I apologize to you once again as um, your board member I I don't think I've done a very good job and I apologize for that I do think though that in your reporting to us if you would report not just the awesome things that are happening, but things that we as board members need to do to help you be successful, that would be helpful to me also. And I would also say that maybe there could be something that sends you to, to professional development on how to work with a board. And um, whether it is a training by KASB, but what I'm seeing, and this is what the Kelly program is helping new administrators do, is how do you work with the board in today's market? And you have a little different board to work with, but I think maybe it would help. And maybe we all need to go to it together, but it would help. When do we do what? And I think it's a big part of, of what we're missing. Thank you. Um, are we going to walk through at any time the KSB recommendations? Or I asked the two of them to give you recommendations as they wanted to see fit for the two schools based upon what uh, the KSB study okay. suggested. So Great. unless you want to go through it with Brian, Brian was here to, to just answer questions about it, but their job today was to take that information and give you recommendations okay. that they well, I have a question uh, for Luann then. Um, obviously, one of the philosophical issues at hand is should kids come to the school for the deaf and stay there their whole school career, or should they be schooled in their communities? And I noticed in the KASB report it said that in Kansas, our average stay at the school is three years l longer than other schools who provide similar services. Can you help me understand why that is? Is there just a difference in philosophy in these other schools that they don't stay as long? What does that look like? I shared that with Brian. Um, I did share with Brian um, how I would respond in the report as far as the length of stay. Um, it's very difficult to come up with an exact average for a length of stay. We have students that come in at the age of three, and we have students that come in in high school. And so that that determines the length of stay of course has an impact on that <clears throat> and our average um, may seem as though it's higher than ever at, than other schools however it's pretty typical there is not actually an actual length of stay and to answer your question should all students attend the Kansas School for the Deaf not necessarily it depends on the IEP team's um, decision and when they're looking at the whole child and what their needs are for social and emotional and academic um, development as well as cognitive development and looking at which environment is the least restrictive environment for that student if that environment is truly analyzed and determined that the public school is indeed the least restrictive environment and it's meaningful for that student and it you can um, predict that that student will be successful then that's a correct placement 
if those options are not there and that possibility doesn't exist, then KSD should be considered as a placement option um, in order to ensure the social and emotional and academic as well as cognitive development. I can't um, speak for all students because it uh, depends on the age of acquisition of language and there's such a, a large variety there of where that happens and when that begins to happen. Um, so do you think we have it about right here? Um, according to the report? No, I mean, in, from your standpoint, do you think we're, we have it about right in terms of how long kids stay at the school? In an ideal world, I would like to have the students come earlier so that they can develop all of those skills. We get students who come to the program who are severely language and socially delayed. And we're trying to determine, you know, a time limit, or we're, we're working within a time limit before they graduate to get them caught up. So if we could buy more time and get them earlier before they actually exit the school, school program or system, um, that would be most beneficial. And I understand that districts aren't always able to provide all the resources that are needed. However, the length of time between that time the determination is made and they actually come to the school needs to be shortened. Um, I know I've seen some reports about, um, it seemed to indicate that students who stayed in home schools did not develop as good a language skills as those students who go to the school for the deaf. I'm wondering, and I don't know if that's true, is that true? And I'm also wondering, do we have any data on academic success of students who are schooled at home versus at the school for the deaf? Um, we do not have that type of data available to us, but I want to be very clear, not all deaf or hard of hearing students that are in their home district are not successful. I want to be very clear about that. There are a number that are successful, but as far as clear data, to make that comparison that's just not available um, to know which program is more successful for which student. And it varies um, individually in the way that each student varies individually. Um, some students benefit from the FM system through the ATU program. Um, some students um, don't have interpreters available to them. Some mm -hmm. students have low, low qualified interpreters. And so it's, um, difficult to answer that without the data and not knowing where the students are. Is there a way to get the data that we haven't accessed? I think if people are going to make a case of it, we ought to know, is there a better path? Is one path better than the I other? I want you to hold that question. We've been here a long time. We have other questions, <laughs> but at this point, we're going to take a 10-minute break. <laughs> Well, we were. Um, we review the question, and then we will. <laughs> well, the question was about how do we collect data to show um, if there is any difference in success, not just academic, but social, emotional, and all those things that matter between students who maybe stay at home or come to the school, or is it better to go part of the time to the school and then go home? I don't know, but it seems like there ought to be some data out there to support. About data? Well, I, I can tell you there's some privacy with data when you get down uh -huh. to uh, end sizes that are below 10 mm. that make mm -hmm. it extremely difficult to, to glean exactly that. What we, what we can, and, I, and I'll share some things with you later, is the performance of the School for the Blind and School for the Deaf. Oh, okay. The performance of special ed kids in general out in the field. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you.
John. Thank you. Uh, on the uh, chart that we got that shows the, the population of the students at different schools that responded to a survey, I guess it wasn't all the schools, it was just the ones that responded to the survey. Um, there were several states, uh, well, Atlanta School for the Deaf, Oregon School for the Deaf, Rocky Mountain School for the Deaf, New Denver, and the Texas School for the Blind. None of these schools showed that they had outreach programs at all. Zero students in outreach. And that we're asking you to do more outreach. Yeah. These other states are doing none. What do you know about their programs and how are they reaching these students? Are these students just, you know, floundering in their in their environment or what's going on? And it's a good question. I, I really can't address some of these other schools. I, I have some familiarity with the Texas School for the Blind Visually Impaired and they have um, a tremendous outreach uh, program and providers uh, across the state regionally. Uh, in some ways, what we're advocating for is, is that, that sort of structure, but they have, I would say, greater funding and um, greater services regionally than, than we have here, but i um, confident in saying that Texas has a very strong outreach program. I know that Superintendent Doherty um, at the school had some comments, and in the comment sections, he was the one who had been at the School for the Blind formerly and said he had a great deal of concern. And, and there are some comments, so maybe take a look at the comments. Maybe it will address it in, in that section. Anything else, John? And I do want to add on to that. Um, most schools, especially, um, do have, and I'm speaking for deaf um, schools, do have outreach. Um, several do not have any outreach at all. Um, it's, they only have campus-based programs alone, and that's it. Some state structures within the state, um, like the Department of Ed or um, vocational rehabs, um, government boards have their own statewide outreach department. Okay. Nina. Thank you. My question does have, and I wasn't sure that we were actually questioning KSB's uh, report yet, but uh, so my question has some similarity to uh, what Ann's did, but it's more based upon statements that you have made um, in your report. And one of those was that you recommend that the School for the Deaf uh, revisit their philosophy on um, sending school, sending students back to public schools as soon as possible. And what is, is there a basis other than what other schools in other states are doing um, I'd like to, to make clarify, that I didn't comment. put that in the report as soon as possible. I, I just mentioned that the School for the Deaf should look, revisit their philosophy on serving students on campus versus off-site. Uh, I'm pretty confident in nowhere in the report that I say that they needed to be sent back as soon as possible. So I don't know where that came from, but I, I said to revisit the philosophy of on-site versus outreach. And I went on to talk about the outreach program that um, has been developed over at the Kansas School for the Blind and how they've regionally placed outreach specialists in those different regions to be more responsive and be available um, at, more regionally so that families wouldn't have to send their kids. And so that's what the basis of that recommendation was. And I'd like to make kind of a statement along with that as a teacher, mm -hmm. former teacher, I guess you could say, of art, I had a number of deaf students a couple of years, and um, because they were placed in our school, and it was amazing. The students who weren't hearing impaired wanted to learn sign language and learned it from this from their peers who did have who were hearing impaired, and they delighted in 
coming up with statements that I didn't know what they were sure, saying. Sure. And so I think it enriches the students in the other, uh, in the school as well, to have them there. So from my point of view, I think it's great that we are doing, we are focusing more on serving students in other uh, areas of the state for a lot of reasons. Right. But um, that, I just wondered why we, um, why you had made so I, a I, recommendation. I'm guessing, I'm guessing the, the recommendation that you're referring to now, and I'm standing here thinking about what I, what I mentioned is the School for the Deaf needed to look at their philosophy and determine how to get students back to their home districts as soon as possible, not meaning tomorrow start that like process, but, when, no, but when, <laughs> when, they, when they have a student that transitions to the campus, then they, should, they need to, to consider what, what's our processes for transitioning that student back to their home district. That's what that, that didn't mean that starting as soon as possible transition kids off the campus. I, I, I agree with the leaders that you've heard today. There are situations and, and some students best, are best served on those campuses. And so that, that may, maybe got misconstrued uh, in, in the interpretation of that. And I'm going to have to interrupt at this point. Our commissioner has to be on a conference call with on our ESSA plan at noon. So we're going to have to stop this conversation now. We really appreciate you being here. We appreciate, I really appreciate the report. I had another couple of comments, but they'll have to wait uh, because uh, we're going to go immediately into executive session and then we have to have him be able to be at the, uh, at the conference with the Department of Education over the approval of our ESSA plan at noon. So thank you. And Kathy, if you'll make the make the uh, make the a motion and make it immediate, uh, I will. I move that the Kansas State Board of Education recess into executive session to discuss the subject of an individual's employee performance, which is justified pursuant to non-elected personnel exception under the Kansas Open Meetings Act in order to protect the privacy in interest of the individual individuals to be discussed. The session will begin immediately with 30 minutes. No action will be taken during the session, and the open meeting will resume in the board meeting at noon. Uh, we invite Randy Watson and Mark Ferguson to join the executive session. Is there a second? Steve Roberts seconds the motion. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? Are you voting, Jim? I voted. <laughs> Okay, we are in executive session. Thank you. Bond issue for state aid for 109 Republic County. There's an exemption for if you haven't had a bond issue for 25 years. It's unclear in the law whether or not that applies to the debt limit. We don't want to take a chance because if you, if you, you can't mess up a bond issue. So we'd rather have you just approve that and there will be no question. And they, the 25 years, it's just whether it's exempt or not. We don't want to take a chance. So we'd rather just have you approve it and then they can proceed and be clean. That's all this to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting us. Yeah, it's, it's already on your agenda. Uh, this, this is just a, a second motion related to that same bond issue. Yes, sir. Yep, yep, yeah. This, is just, this just clarifies that the bond debt limit applies. Yes, sir. No, I think you need to. I think you ought to take action to approve the the exemption from the bond debt limit. I, so I would make a motion based on your recommendation and not Charlie. Yeah. Well, it's just for the safety. I, you don't want to mess it up. That's I take that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to make a motion that says what this says. Well, you have to read that. Okay. It is moved that the Kansas State Board of Education issue an order authorizing USD 109 Republic County. Uh, to hold an election on the question of issuing bonds in excess of the district's general bond debt limitation.
Okay, I move to extend the executive session for an additional 15 minutes to deal with uh, non-elected personnel exemption, and the open me meeting will resume in the board room at 12:16. Mark, Mark will be here. Including Mark in it. Why? Why? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Alright. Yeah, you're included. You're included. Alright. Okay. Nick will need to. All in favor? All in favor? 